Welcome. The following interview was conducted with George McNally, Professor Emeritus of Applied Technology, Dean Emeritus of, of the uh, Technology on fr for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, January 23rd, 2009, in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank and you. Nice to have you here. It's a delight to be here. And of course, uh, at my age, rambling is more like the conversations I get into. So today will be a ramble. Uh, okay. Well, I'm so following a very loosely, uh, really a, a, a what I'd call a schedule that you gave me, and and uh, I uh, I came from a interesting, I think, an interesting background. I was not born in the Midwest, but I'm calling myself a Midwesterner because I've spent most of my life here. But I was born in Philadelphia back in March 26, 1926. And my father uh, and mother were both from the Midwest and they had gone east because my father was an interior store designer. He would uh, uh, go into these large department stores and design the interior, sell the equipment for the interior of the store, and this is the way he made his money. And, uh, of course, the big stores at that time were in the East. And so we centered in Philadelphia, although eventually we moved to New York City, where he had an office, and so I spent my very, very early childhood in New York City. Mm -hmm. But uh, when the Depression came along, uh, the stores were very reluctant to do any kind of uh, uh, modernization. So they just quit doing this. And he decided to come back to the Midwest and kind of go back to what he did before he became a store designer. So we, back in 1935, uh, we moved back to Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And this is where I grew up. Okay. And Cedar Rapids was a place where uh, my parents were married, and they knew very well, although they weren't from Cedar Rapids. Uh, and my mother had been a secretary, and her uh, boss was a man that ran the business college in Cedar Rapids. And he was a man that uh, developed all this writing stuff that we took in grade school. I don't know if you remember doing the circles of penmanship. And uh, he... Um, had my mother as a secretary, and she did all those early penmanship things. Her handwriting was absolutely perfect. Now, I don't know what happened in my case, because I must have inherited some tail end of the family, because I don't write well. But her writing was perfect. But at any rate, she went back and, and became a secretary in Cedar Rapids, and my father uh, went back to sales work and did sales work in Cedar Rapids. So, I came in really to the grade school system in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa from the east. And I found that the, the um, academic work in Cedar Rapids was far superior to anything I had in Philadelphia. We had our own music teachers, our own art teachers. We went from class to class, even in fourth grade. So I had, I think, now that I look back on it, an exceptional uh, experience education-wise in Cedar Rapids. Unfortunately, my father died when I was 14, which was a terrible loss. And my mother, of course, was doing secretarial work, and she took care of the family. I had a brother that was three years older than I was, really a, a two years older. And uh, so she brought us up. And uh, I enjoyed my high school experience. I uh, was very, very active in music and very active in the art area. Uh, I played the violin and the viola and I sang. And, uh, but I was also interested in sports. I was out for football and track and did a lot of work in the sports area. When I graduated from, from high school, I uh, was right at the height of World War II. 1944. So I joined the military and I was fortunate enough to get into a very special 
uh, program in electronics in the Navy. This was a year's program that taught us electronics all the way from uh, knowing what an ohm was up through radar. So I learned to be a technician, a radio technician. And this was my job in the Navy. And then when I graduated from that, I was assigned to a shipboard activity. And I was in charge of all the electronics on the ship. So this was a tremendous uh, experience being a technician. And the, uh, of course, the program itself, I think, was one of the finest programs that uh, the Navy ever had. Uh, you really learned electronics. And of course, I was thinking about that. Maybe after military, I would go into that. But I was also interested in chemistry. So um, when I got out of the Navy, I uh, came back to Iowa, but I was so late in 1946 that I couldn't get into Iowa State University where they had the chemistry and the chemical engineering that I wanted. So I stayed right there in Cedar Rapids and went to Coe College, which was a small liberal arts college, but had a very, very good science faculty and a very good chemistry faculty. So I majored in chemistry, physics, and mathematics. I was in that science direction. However, being a liberal arts school, you couldn't get away with not taking psychology, sociology, history, language, art. You took everything, so you were liberally educated. So really, in my undergraduate program, if I had to put any emphasis at all on it, was liberal arts. And because I was on the GI Bill, and they paid for everything, I took many, many more courses than I needed to graduate. And when I finally did graduate, I must have had at least 50% more courses than I ever needed in terms of credit. Well, the problem there was I was going to do graduate work in chemistry. I was all set to do that. I had interviewed in a number of places around the Midwest. However, I was on the verge of getting married. I'd met the right girl, who still, by the way, is with me. And uh, in so I needed help in doing this, although she was qualified to be a teacher. And all during our marriage, uh, in the early years, she taught. However, I needed an assistantship. Well, my senior year, I took a course in psychology. It's my first course. And uh, I found this to be a very natural area for my inclinations and interests and what have you. And um, as I was looking for an assistantship, my psychology professor said, why don't you go into psychology? I said, well, I don't know anything. I've only had one course. He says, I can get you an assistantship better than anything you can get in chemistry. And I said, well, that's very unusual. And at that moment, he got on the phone and talked to the head of the, of the Department of Psychology at Iowa State University, who over the phone offered me an assistantship that was far superior to anything I could get in chemistry. I thought, well, even though I've got four years of chemistry here and uh, no background in psychology, why not? So in the middle of nowhere, I switched from chemistry to psychology and went to Iowa State University where I was a research assistant. And I found that because of my science background, mathematics and what have you, I was exactly the right person to be in that program because graduate work was very, very quantitative, very mathematically oriented. And almost all the people that I was competing with were psych majors and undergraduate mainly to avoid science and mathematics. So here I was right in the middle of mathematics, and it was a perfect match. So as a result, I did very, very well in my graduate work. And uh, this was a quarter system at uh, Iowa State. And the second quarter, my major professor had an illness. And I had taken at Coe College uh, a teaching prep uh, program where I actually 
practice taught chemistry at the local high school and what have you. So I had my practice teaching what have you. They said, McNally, you want to teach? We'll put you into teaching. So exactly one year after I took my first course in psychology, I was teaching it. Well, that's the way you really learn. So uh, uh, during my uh, work at Iowa State, I taught most of the time while I was doing my graduate work. It was a two-year program. They had no PhD program, only a master. So it was very intense. I not only took uh, the more classical psychology, experimental and what have you, but I was deeply involved in clinical psychology. So I had a real good background. My second year, we had a visiting professor from Purdue. His name was Archie Colby. I don't know if you knew Archie Colby or not. But he had been a graduate student here, and he, he decided to do this uh, visiting professor thing, and he went to Iowa State. Well, the head of the department was a man by the name of Bill Owens, and he wanted me to go to, to Minnesota, where he had graduated. And he was getting everything ready for me to take my PhD there. And Archie says, you don't want to do that. He says, you want to come to Purdue. And I said, I don't know a thing about Purdue. He says, it's more industrially oriented. We can get you into industrial <coughs> psychology. And uh, he said, you don't want to be an experimental psychologist. You get into something more, a broader area than that. So he uh, arranged for me to visit Purdue, I think in about January of 1953. And uh, so I came with him all the way to Lafayette from Ames, Iowa, and I met all the faculty on the industrial uh, psychology staff here. Tiffin, Lashi, Kephart, all the McCormick, all these very, very great industrial psychologists. And out of hand, they gave me an XR, an experimental uh, assistantship that would pay for doing my PhD work. And I had my thesis idea, I brought it with me from Iowa State, so that I didn't have to lean on any of the faculty to get an idea to do a PhD. So they put me into the spot and paid me to do my research for my PhD, which was a marvelous thing to do. Mm -hmm. And of course, Louise taught you out here at Otterburn. You were married by that time. Mm -hmm. And I, had as a major professor uh, Ernie McCormick, who was one of the great human factors uh, people in the whole world. But at any rate, uh, this was what I was doing, and Ernie had had polio when he was in the Navy and uh, was quite crippled. And he fell down the stairs the second semester. And here, was the problem of teaching his classes. Well, they knew I had had teaching experience, and I was about the only graduate student that had that. So they contacted me and said, look, we'll make you a full-time instructor, and you can finish up your PhD because you've done all your coursework, and you can teach full-time. So this is exactly what I did. So I got on the staff very, very early here at Purdue and uh, enjoyed this experience. And no time at all, I was in charge of all the beginning psychology courses. Just, again, two and a half years after I'd taken my first course in this area. But at any rate, I found this a very natural thing to do. It was fun. I had good colleagues. And uh, so I finished up my work at Purdue as an instructor. And uh, when I got my PhD, they said, why don't you stay on with the faculty? Well, I really wanted to do this, but I could not afford to do it. They offered me, I think, $4,500 a year, Catherine, to teach full time. And they said, this is a good offer, $4,500 a year. And I added up, I needed a new car. We were being kicked out of the black and whites where we lived, so I needed to have a house. Louise was pregnant. I added all these figures up, and lo and behold, it didn't work out. I couldn't live on $4,500 a year. Well, my senior year, I had taken a course in training methods uh, by a man named Professor Graney. 
and uh, he had just come back from starting the uh, uh, training program in Inland Steel Company. And during his course, we met a lot of the Inland people. So I got a chance to go to Inland Steel Company up there and visit with people. With so when I graduated, I had an offer from them to come and to Inland Steel Company and be with their management program. So immediately, I made twice as much as I would have at Purdue. And I had a whole year of training in how to make steel. Uh, this was a very intense program, 10 hours a day, going to classes and going to all the departments at Inland Steel Company while I did this work. Now, one of the classes I first started was metallurgy, and of course this is very much like chemistry. And the first night I was in this metallurgy class, Millard Geit, who was the director of the Calumet campus at Hammond, we were doing all this there at night, came into the classroom and motioned for me to come out. I went into the hall and he said, I've just talked to the instructor. He says, you don't have to go to class anymore. He says, you're going to be teaching with us. And I thought, oh my gosh. I said, I'm all set to come to this class, Miller. And he said, he said one of our instructors had an appendectomy and psychology, the psychology professor. He said, you've got to take over all of her classes. I thought to myself, here I'm working eight hours a day going to class and I, now he wants me to teach. He says, I've arranged for you to take your, your, your exams. You don't have to go to class. Well, this is exactly what I did. I took the exams and didn't go to class and taught all of this young woman's uh, courses. Well, when she came back to work, there I was still teaching because he needed another psychology professor. The interesting part about doing all this is that I had more latitude up there than I would have here. And I, of course, always wanted to teach a course in abnormal psychology. But to do this, you really ought to have a PhD in the clinical area. I had almost a master's in this area and a lot of experience. So I taught a course in abnormal, and I, I had exciting classes and uh, we went to the mental hospitals and did all the things of putting on uh, seminars and what have you. And this was terribly interesting to me. I taught industrial psychology. I taught uh, applied psychology. And I did all this, including working eight hours a day in the steel mill. So in a sense, I never really left Purdue. I just went to one of the regional campuses and taught almost, well, I did teach full time. So, uh, in a sense, while my record doesn't show it, I never really left Purdue. And I stayed at Inland Steel Company for eight years. Instead of going into the personnel area where they thought I might go, I liked production. So I went into the actual producing of, of steel. And I was in that area eight years, and I was a management person in that field all the way from being a, a foreman up. And this was a tremendous leadership experience for me. And of course, at the same time, I taught at the Calumet campus. So in a sense, what I had here was a, a Navy technician background, uh, an industrial experience in actual production of steel, which meant I worked with engineers and scientists and, and actual people in this field. And uh, I had a great, great background in leadership in, in this industry. Well, at any rate, I'd always kept in contact with Purdue. My dearest friend was a man by the name of Eric Clithrow. Did you know him, yeah, Catherine? Exactly. He was a man that was brought here by Hovde to start the philosophy department. And they got him from Coe College, where I did my undergraduate. And he was our faculty advisor in my fraternity. So this was one of my really dear, dear friends. And they brought him to Purdue. He was a great teacher, one of the finest teachers I've ever met. And of course, has got all the awards here at Purdue. But at any rate, um, he came here just before I came as a graduate student in 1952 or 53. And um, 
uh, we were very, very dear friends all this time. So he was always carping at me to come back to Purdue. Well, Chuck Lawshey, who had been my colleague in psychology, uh, now was with the regional campuses and became vice president and dean of that area. And he'd been carping at me to come back, too. Well, I finally added up the, the figures and found out that in the meantime, faculty were getting salary increases. So we now had a competition here where I could make almost as much at Purdue as I would have in the steel mill. And uh, so I didn't really have much reluctance. I left the steel mill and came back here. And I was put in charge of all the two-year associate degree programs. And we were upgrading this to college-level work uh, here and on all the regional campuses. So my job was to coordinate all of this. And uh, I was Let me ask you a question. The director. associates, were they scattered throughout the university, or was it just in what was now this, the School of Technology? This was carried out under the continuing education area. So Lossi was in charge of this. Okay. And uh, here on this campus, the major two-year degrees were out in aviation. Um, we did not have the engineering-related technologies on this campus. These were all on <clears throat> the various regional campuses around the state. And they were there because industry wanted those people. These were started by uh, Dean Potter during World War II. And when World War II was over, they were going to dry all these up, and industry said, no, we want those people. So our many of the associate degree programs, and most of them, were at those regional campuses. So my first year was spent really traveling around the state. To see what the offerings were that. and what they were doing. Mm -hmm, to find out what they're doing. and, and uh, uh, we were increasing the um, rigor of these programs, more mathematics and what have you, so that we could give real college credit for these programs. And of course, um, this was my major job to work with the regional campus uh, chancellors and what have you. And this was a very pleasant thing to do. Uh, I enjoyed all these people. They were very, very good people. And at any rate, one of the problems was when I came on board, uh, there was what was called an ECPD inspection of the program. This was an accreditation thing. I had nothing to do with this because I came on after they'd done this inspection, inspection. Well, back came the word that we were not accredited in these areas, engineering-related technology. Well. Here was another challenge. How do we get our accreditation back? How do we upgrade these programs to meet all the CPD standards and what have you? So uh, my first year was to try and figure out what to do. And at the end of the first year, I had an idea that we should create a mechanical engineering technology department, an electrical engineering technology department, a construction technology, and all these various engineering-related technologies would come under separate heads. And we were able to select very fine people to head these programs up. So we went to Paul Chino, who was then vice president, and got his approval to do this, and then we were on the way. We shortly got reaccredited, and these programs uh, became really nationally known. And. Uh, here we had all these two-year programs. Many of the graduates wanted to go on for bachelor's degrees. So we had to develop something for them. So one of my first challenges was to help create new bachelor's program. At, the, at this time, Lawshe had the concept that yesterday's science is today's engineering is tomorrow's technology. And what was really happening, engineering was withdrawing from some of these various areas that were very applied. Uh, they didn't want to teach uh, foundry anymore. And yet industry still needed the people that had this background. And many industry people were saying, where's the old engineer we used to get? 
Well, the new engineer was scientifically oriented, mathematically based, and they had withdrawn from all these very applied areas, even though industry still needed those people. So Chuck Law, she tried to get engineering to create bachelor's degrees in these areas uh, to meet industry's needs. But engineering, George Hawkins was for it, but the faculty were not for that. They were on the kick of tying with science. So they was, were, were withdrawing from all these areas. So engineering had a chance to do this, but they just didn't want to do it. So we put together uh, a committee uh, that really represented all the areas at Purdue to try and do something about this problem. And as a result of this, we created the School of Technology. And uh, while I came back in 62, it was in 64 that we developed this and uh, got a, the appropriate approval. And uh, here we were, just a few people, starting a brand new school. And uh, Dean Law, she became dean of the school first dean of the school, and I became his associate dean. What really meant was that once a year we got a budget together and I took care of the rest of it. But Where were you located? Where was your facility? Where we you? had no facilities at all other than some room in Michael Golden and a few little laboratories here and there. My office was in South Campus Courts in a, in a a prefab building that now belongs to vet medicine. And uh, I walked a lot, let's put it that way, and, and the faculty that were stationed there walked a lot. We were in the best shape of any faculty on the campus. That's probably why I'm still alive. But at any rate, this was a very, very interesting time. And um, we were to coordinate all the two-year programs on the campus. And at the same time that we started to improve our engineering-related program, uh, nursing came on campus. Helen Johnson became the first head of nursing, and uh, nursing was put in the School of Technology. So here we were with engineering-related technologies, nursing, we had supervision, we had a computer area, we had, we had uh, uh, the aeronautical area, the, uh, the uh, aviation area. We were a real hodgepodge of programs. And uh, at any rate, we got ourselves organized. We got along just perfectly, all of us. And uh, in 1966, they made me dean of this hodgepodge. But at that time, we were growing unbelievably rapidly. Um, we had it when we counted the regional campuses that we coordinated, over 13,000 students. This was bigger than anything on the campus, including engineering and, and the liberal arts. So here was a liberal arts person with a little bit of technology heading up this uh, uh, great big new vigorous school. Well, one of the first things we did as we got more faculty on these regional campuses was to give them academic autonomy, where they were in charge of their own program, their own curricula, and what have you. And there would be a man in charge of the program there and would not report to me. So I was part of tearing all this up into little pieces and letting them have autonomy. In the meantime, we brought the engineering-related technology to this campus which meant we had a very interesting interface with engineering because what they were withdrawing from, we were picking up. And of course, the faculty that we had, and this was part of our commission, literally, the faculty had to have a master's degree plus industrial experience. In other words, they had to actually have been doing this in industry. Well, this meant that our faculty was different than the rest of the campus. The rest of the campus was quite academically oriented. You had the PhD, and many of the people with the PhD never had experience in that field. 
in the real world. Whereas all of our faculty were real world people. Now, in a sense, it's almost putting oil with water or vice versa. A few of us had PhDs, but not many. And uh, what we tried to do was head in that direction, let's put it that way, but we wanted that industrial experience. So if we picked somebody up with a PhD, they had to be with industrial experience. There weren't a lot of those people around. But at any rate, we worked on this interface with engineering. And I had, a, I think, a pretty good relationship with all the deans of engineering. We had to be very careful our faculty didn't get into their fields. And uh, this was a very tricky thing because our faculty quickly, you know, felt they were the real engineering. Well, the real engineering is what's being done in the engineering school, not in technology. So it was a very, very tricky thing to do and to set up the mechanisms that could do this without the dean putting his hand in there. And a lot of my time was spent in setting up mechanisms where the faculty could be heard uh, without me getting into it. But at any rate, I think we did a pretty good job of this, although on occasion we did have problems. And I'm going to tell you one funny incident. Uh, along in the, I think, late 60s, early 70s, engineering had a drop in enrollment. There weren't as many students coming into engineering. They were very worried about this. Well, uh, Marion Scott, who was associate uh, head of engineering, um, invited me to an engineering dinner. And I thought that was kind of these people to do this. They had a nice dinner. And at the end of the dinner, Marion got up and with these great big charts showed the decrease in enrollment in engineering. And then he showed the chart of the increase in enrollment in technology. And then he introduced me and he says, and our major speaker tonight will be George McNally. He didn't tell me I was going to have to speak. I thought I was going to eat a dinner and enjoy it. Well, <clears throat> it was clear that this was an execution. And so I got up and I said, I thank them for inviting me to the dinner. And I said, I think the statistics shown are very, very interesting. And I said, I want you to know, however, that our engineering related technologies and electronics, mechanical, and are having a similar decrease. And that if you would look at our enrollment, you would find the only increase we've had is in nursing. And I said, I don't think any of the nurses would be potential engineering students. So I said, all the loss you've had in engineering students has not been from our engineering related technology. And our increase has only been nursing. Boy, just like putting a, uh, a needle uh, in a balloon. Here they thought they had me, see, and I was just lucky to squeeze out of that. But at any rate, um, I suggested to them that they get somebody to head up this problem. And uh, uh, they got a man from industry that actually was on our faculty, but we assigned him to engineering. And he headed up this area. And boy, it wasn't long before engineering was saying, hey, no, no more students, no more students. We've got enough. And then at that time, he came to me, and we brought him back to technology. Mm -hmm. But uh, these problems occur. And of course, if you don't know the real details, you know, you accuse people of the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. But all in all, engineering people were dear friends of mine. In fact, some of my dearest friends were the engineering people. Of course, at, in industry, I daily worked with engineering. And when one looked at my science background and, and what have you, my background was really modern engineering. And uh, so in a sense, I was really a modern engineer. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, that's 
brought us up to uh, the School of Technology. And pretty shortly, we were pretty much this campus. Uh, that didn't mean we didn't still coordinate the North Central Campus, which was a smaller entity. And we also coordinated um, the campuses w where Indiana University had programs. And we would start our program on their campus using their English, their math, their science, but teaching our own technology courses. So we had programs at Columbus, Richmond, uh, and of course Indianapolis it became a separate campus and combined with, with uh, IU, as did Fort Wayne. But, uh, and South Bend, we finally had a program there. And every spring I would be with the IU top people giving out degrees for Purdue, while John Ryan, who was president then, would give out the IU. So I became very, very dear friends with Indiana University. And uh, I remember at one of these graduations at Kokomo, uh, John Ryan came to me and says, I've got a problem. He says, maybe you can help me. He says, I've got a son who's not an IU person. He says, he's more interested in mechanics. He says, he really ought to be at Purdue. But he... Um, started IU and flunked out. Then he fell in love with an IU girl, a music major. And she finally told him he'd taken a job as a meter reader for the gas company. And finally she said to him, she said, Kevin, I love you, but I never thought I should marry a meter reader. Well, this stimulated him to say, I've got to get a degree. So he said, do you suppose you could get him into Purdue? I said, send him up. So he came to Purdue. I interviewed him. And I, I took him on probation and surrounded him with some of our scholars from technology, technology so that every night he was at a study table studying and what have you. This kid did very, very well. And uh, one of John Ryan's proudest moments was showing off Purdue University bookends that his ki his son had cast in our foundry, and they were on his desk down at IU. But at any rate, Kevin graduated in two of our areas. He went as a manager manager at General Motors, made a lot of money. John told me he said, when he built a house, he married the girl, had a family. He never asked John for a penny when he had to build a house. He says he's making more money than any one of our family. And this, I think, is a, a nice success story, story yes. with, nice addition. with yeah. IU. Right. But at any rate, we had good relationships with Indiana University. And I think probably more than anything else, I tried to develop uh, relationships with people uh, because this was the fun part of the job. You know, the detail part is not real fun. Mm -hmm. But when we come to Purdue, uh, of course, all these heads that we had at Purdue, from Helen Johnson to Linnell Gattis, by the way, she came on when I was still head of nursing through the technology area. I remember when she came on campus, Helen came to me, she said, I've just had a young lady come to me that, has a PhD in physiology and a master's in nursing. I said, Helen, hire her immediately. So this is when we hired Linnell. But she was absolutely the perfect answer to us. But at any rate, my relationships with all the department heads and whatever I think was good. Uh, we, we controlled literally our school using a statistical approach. I worked with all the heads to come up, come up with measurable statistics that would tell us how they were doing. In other words, whether, whether this is the number of student contact hours they were teaching per faculty uh, equivalent, or you name it. I said, come in with these things, tell us how to measure them, and we'll measure them and get this material to you. Well, we had statistics on everything, and the heads all were given 
monthly reports on these statistics, there were no, the, the, there were no surprises. If we didn't replace a faculty member in one area, it was because they'd lost students. Now remember, Catherine, in a university, you really shouldn't deviate from liberal arts and science. These are the basic building stones of a university. When you want to start a new program giving specialized education, you've got to have a reason to do this. There's got to be a need. So you've got to have a societal need for specialized education. Otherwise, you should never deviate from liberal arts and science. And I'm, I'm a real liberal arts person. This, this is my area and science. Well, one of the first things we did in technology was create an Office of Manpower Studies. They did studies in all these regions to find out what were the needs, the involved industrial people. At all times, our school has involved the real live industrial people that you see around the state so that our programs reflect what they need. However, at the same time, and this is probably the only stake that I drove down, I don't want you to drop the courses in speech and writing and English and all these, because we don't know what these students are gonna do later in life. Right. They can't be just narrow technician. And if anything at all that I've gotten across, it's been that don't develop just a narrow technician. Give enough technical courses to get that first job and then they'll carry on from there. But at any rate, uh, the manpower office is the one that justified going into these very programs. And if there was a decreasing need, this was immediately re reflect, reflected in the number of students we took in the program. If there was less need for, let's say, electrical engineering technology people, take fewer, a few fewer students. Get rid of a faculty member and put him over where there is a need. We never had enough money. So we had to always be very, very close with what we did. At any rate, there were no surprises to any of these department heads. It wasn't suddenly the deans pulling a man from it. They knew he was going to be lost because they were losing students or there was no need for their graduates. So, this kind of use of statistics was not reflected by the university. Uh, in all the time I was here, we never had access to the decision-making statistics used by the vice presidents and the president. This was a mistake, a real mistake. There never should have been surprises among the dean, and yet there were surprises in terms of how the money was distributed. Um, I didn't like that at all. I remember once finding, in a very circuitous way, which I won't detail, but that we were being judged on the basis of statistics that I didn't even know were part of our budget. Uh, the Purdue Aeronautics Corporation, I don't know if you remember them or not, I they had they jets know. out here and they were running them. I found out that all of their equipment was assigned to our school. I mean, we're talking about multi-million dollars worth of uh, repair equipment, space, uh, airplanes, all kinds of things assigned to us. And, you know, we weren't that big a budget. And this meant that an inappropriate amount was put on that. And so George Hawkins would look at the statistics and say, your, your cost per hour of instruction, the highest on the campus, where we were the lowest. We had the biggest, we had the fattest uh, workloads of anybody, but the statistics didn't show it. And it was a long time before I found that out when I, when I really, really tell when I found that out. That should never have been. And that was an assignment made by the financial office without ever telling us. Now, this, this is not right. Mm -hmm. So. We had several years there where we didn't get really anything. Uh, as far as money for laboratories, we were laboratory oriented. Uh, when Phil Haas became provost, and by the way, he was one of the greatest people that I have ever met. This was one of the most honest guys that I ever knew. 
He never gave us money for laboratories. And I'm not griping about it at all. He didn't need to. You see, all of our faculty being from industry, if we wanted, let's say, uh, materials or equipment in a fluid power laboratory, our fluid power faculty member would call his old company and the next day it would be shipped to us, no charge. We could equip laboratories, Catherine, with no cost to the university. And but Phil then, knew this, whereas a physics professor didn't have this recourse. He didn't have these contacts. So not only did I have my industrial faculty getting things for the laboratories, but I had a couple of very wonderful people in Richard Hansen and uh, Bob Hoffer, who were very, very wealthy, wealthy industrialists who took us under their wing. And they were always calling me to say, can't you have some more projects for us? They were spending millions on us. Not only did we get a laboratory, but they would set up a, a fund so they would current, keep it current. So we had living laboratories. At no time would our laboratories get behind, whereas most of the university they built a lab and in 10 years was outdated. We were putting money in them all the time from these very, very wonderful people. So as a result, over the years, we had the finest laboratories and still do in the whole world. Uh, I had visitors from other countries come here and uh, they'd say, we have one of these microprocessors and you have a whole lab full. And this was typical of all our laboratories. Our laboratories were the best and continue to be under the, the uh, leadership of the present school. Yes. So at any rate, Phil knew this and this is why he never gave us any money. And I would have done the same thing had I been provost too. Okay. Now, another one of our strong, strong pushes in technology was in the international area. We were very internationally oriented. Part of this is because as soon as I came to Purdue, the State Department had contacted President Hugby and said that Afghanistan needed help. So in early 63, uh, President Hovde called uh, Chuck Lashi and he said, would you put McNelly on this Afghan thing? So I was assigned to this Afghan program, which was a consortium of 11 other universities that were going to work under USAID with their money to develop Kabul University's engineering faculty. And we would put advisors over there in the engineering area and at the same time provide money for them and for the laboratories and what have you. And also take recent Kabul University engineering people, graduates, over here to work on their advanced degrees to go back and teach. So this was a job that I had for 10 years I was on the uh, consortium committee. And this is what got us into international activity. And I also worked on developing these relationships with Germany, England, and Ireland, so that we had uh, these contacts and had faculty from these various areas come over here and teach, and vice versa. We send faculty. One of the biggest problems in technology is somehow or another to keep your faculty from teaching history. It's so easy to teach what it used to be. And after a few years, that's exactly what you're doing, unless you have some kind of contact with the real world. So we tried to get our faculty out into industry every year. We had industrial advisory committees for each of the curricula to keep these curricula current. And we had th this exchange with other, other countries which also helped. So trying to keep your faculty from teaching history, even though it's a nice liberal arts area, is, is, was one of my big problems. But at any rate, we, we had a lot of fun doing that. Mm -hmm. 
And what pleases me is both Dean Gentry and uh, our new dean is, uh, uh, they're both very, very interested in international activities. And I'm very pleased with that. We, we have to think internationally. Uh, the people of, of uh, Indiana don't realize how strong we are in international activities. We export a lot of things from the state. Uh, but this doesn't mean you get into any activity in the international area. I was once asked to go over and see whether we should develop a relationship with Algeria. And uh, John Hancock and I, and Woods Thomas went over there. And we visited Algeria, and the first thing they did was take us to this new city they were building. It was all out of marble, unbelievable, beautiful city. It was to be a university city, and they were to teach engineering and what have you, and they had these beautiful laboratories. And we visited this city, even though I later found out that hardly any American would ever be permitted to see it. We got to the city, we had a nice luncheon, and in preparation for the luncheon, in the men's room, there was a man with a beard and a whiskey bottle full of water, and he was helping us wash our hands. And I said, well, where's the water? Well, we don't always have water. Uh, maybe every few weeks the water shut off, and people fill their bath, they're told when it's going to happen. They fill their bathtubs full of water, and this is to last them until it comes back on again. I said, we want American wives to come into this beautiful city where you've got a bathtub full of water, and that's the water. It'll never work. So both John and I came back, and we advised that they not do this. It just would not work. Would not work. And uh, those that did get into it from other universities, it didn't work. So that's one where we turned it down. Another one was I was invited once to go to Princeton to visit with uh, the president of Princeton and Yaki Amani, who was the oil minister for Saudi Arabia. And uh, I spent uh, three or four days with these people. And they wanted us to help with a Saudi institution. And I thought this would be good because Saudis had money. They had the, the right environment to do this. And I came back and I told President Hubdi, I said, we probably sh could do this. However, knowing the state and the people, we should have a letter from the State Department saying that it's absolutely essential from a, an oil point of view, economic point of view, to get into this relationship. So we contacted the uh, State Department top people, and we knew them well. Okay. And you want to stop it for a second? Excuse me just a minute. Go ahead. Sorry. I suggested uh, to President Hovde that he get uh, an appropriate letter from the State Department. Well, in no time at all came a letter from the State Department saying, I think it's good for Purdue to be with this relationship because it, it would be culturally important to them. I said, that's not good enough. I said, they didn't mention the oil, didn't mention anything about our foreign relations here that would help economically or anything else. And so we turned that down. And I think that was a fine thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, justifying this to the state legislature would have been a very difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, uh, the things we took up were probably uh, more important than the things we turned down, but we had a good relationship with Britain. And uh, I still keep these contacts, by the way. Some of the people that I was associated with in the British area, I still see, I still talk to. They're great, great people. In terms of the inside of the university, I did want to mention this, that uh, uh, Two people that uh, 
I spent a lot of time with Catherine, you may not know this, was Jack Moriarty and Oliver Dunn. These were two of my closest friends, and I would see them uh, every now and then. I'd come over to the library and go to Jack's office, and Jack would call and say, George is here, Oliver, come on in. We close the door. These were the two people I could I could discuss mosaics from Ravenna or Song Dynasty ceramics with these two guys, and couldn't with anybody else on the campus. Uh, these were two of the greatest people that I have ever met in my whole life, and I spent a lot of time with them. We dearly love one another, and. Uh, uh, these are really, when I think back, of all the relationships I had on this campus, uh, those were the finest. I really liked these guys. And we could discuss anything and did. Uh, they had a sympathetic ear, and they, in a sense, operated under the same dumb, short budget as we did, so we had a lot of things in common. and. Uh, I really like them. Mm -hmm. But when I look at all the pages of people that I knew here, uh, all the administrators from Ed Elliott on, uh, I had relation, a relationship with each of these people uh, a different way that I worked with them. And every one of them were great people. Uh, I met some of the finest people, really, that I've ever met in my life here at Purdue. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience. And all the professors from all these various areas. I uh, forgot to tell you that in my early years, my uncle owned a farm in western Iowa. From the time I was 12, I was shipped out to his farm, and I farmed all summer. So in a sense, I grew up a farmer. And while I also did other work during the school year, this farm background was very, very important to me. And again, the rela relationship I had with the ag people was just tremendous. Right. These were all my friends. Uh, got so many of them. And of course, my undergraduate work being in science, I was close to the chemistry department and the science people. And because of all my liberal arts, I was interested in the liberal arts area. And my personal interest in things, I, I'm most interested in the visual arts. I'm, I'm very interested in uh, uh, all the artwork, and as a result, 50 years ago I started to paint and sculpt. So I do this, I do a lot of this, and uh, it seems strange that somebody from a science area would get into that, or a technology area, but this is very important to me. And so today, in retirement, most of my time is spent in the visual arts. I spend most of my time painting. And uh, of course, as a result, I've got a collection of painting, not only my own, but others that our house is absolutely cluttered with painting. Uh, and what I do, I, I study really the visual arts like I'd study chemistry. I study in a very detailed way. And my hobbies of collecting things, uh, I've, I've become a collector in the Oriental area, so that I have a collection of Oriental antiques, for instance, that, and books on Oriental uh, things, and belong to Oriental societies and whatever, that uh, I've become more knowledgeable in this area than any of my fac the faculty that I ever knew. Uh, knew about this area. Uh, and my collection of certain kinds of ceramics 
is uh, very unusual. It's a collection worth a great deal of money, and it's very rare. And uh, again, I study this all the time. But these are areas that, you know, a has-been technologists tend to drift into. I don't study technology at all. I know what's going on a little, but um, I'm not very interested in that anymore. So you that, shifted your interest a little bit, which is you know, good. My, you my like interests that. are right. are different. I, I go to a lot of museums. I know a lot of people in the visual arts, and those are the people that I like. Mm -hmm. I, li mm -hmm. I like to associate with them. Right. Is there anybody Personality-wise, in the university, you'd like me to discuss. I I've got all these names of people that I knew. Uh, you, you have mentioned some. Is there a particular one that you'd want to make a comment on? And I do do, do want you to uh, mention about Kanoi Hall, uh, how that got started, your facilities. Well, because you in didn't a have sense, a building. In a sense, Kanoi Hall. It, it represents the administration's effort to finally do something about technology. We were spread all over the campus. Mm -hmm. We didn't have one place to go. And finally, I think they had to do something. I was complaining all the time. They had to shut me up some way or another. And Kanoi Hall represents that kind of thing. Finally getting that building was a culmination of, again, years and years and years, mm -hmm. Catherine, of complaining. And uh, I'll never forget an incident, and I've never told anybody this. I was in Stewart Center one day, and I saw John Hicks. And he said, oh, he said, by the way, he said, the commission's going to talk about your new building tomorrow in Indianapolis. He's, and I said, well, should I go, John? He said, you can go if you want to. So I said, are you going to go down, John? He said, yeah. I said, can I ride with you? He said, I've got some other things to do afterwards. So I went over to Motor Pool and got a car lined up, canceled some appointments, and decided to drive down there. So I drive down there, go to the commission meeting, and I'm sitting next to President Hanson. He says, George, he says, I'm not going to say much at all, and the rest is up to you. I thought I was just going here to see what they were going to say, and he said, the rest is up to you. Well, I heard what they had in mind for the size of the building, which was a third less than we could possibly need. Well. You've got to understand that how you decide on the size of a building, I think pretty much, Catherine, is what you decide you can get from the legislature, not what the, you know, the facility is needed, I mean, how much is needed. Well, that wasn't enough, not nearly enough. As soon as I heard the size of the building and Hanson saying, the rest is up to you, I thought, okay, you guys. You really didn't want me here anyway. So I got in front of the commission, and I'm always full of statistics. And I gave them the growth of the school. I gave them what we expected to be in terms of size. I gave them all the rest that we needed in the laboratories and what have you. Finally, the chairman, and I forget who it was, stepped up and he said, well, Obviously, he said, I'm going to make a motion to increase the size of the technology building. Well, that's what I wanted, of course. And here's John Hicks back there. And John says, we got the message. You don't need to have any, any motion at all. We've got the message. So as a result of that, the technology building is a third larger than they had ever thought in terms of asking for. And uh, John did keep his promise. They put in a bid for a bigger building, and that's what we got. Mm -hmm. But it was still way, way too small. And of course, they're now 
finding that out. Mm -hmm. But uh, it gives you an insight into how things work in the university. Things were not as well planned in terms of statistics, but I'm so mathematically oriented that, you know, this is the way I am. But I've got a lot of stories about uh, these kinds of things, you know, how, in a sense, uh, I don't want to say loosely, but informally things happen around the university. Um, I know once, I don't know if you knew Bill Cottingham, did you know him? He was head of mechanical engineering for a long time. Bill and I were pretty good friends. He liked technology because he was a former journeyman boilermaker. Can you imagine a boilermaker here on Purdue campus? Who had decided to get academic and went on and got his PhD. So he kind of knew what we were doing and liked what we were doing. And one day I was in his office and he said, you know, George, he says, I'm kind of getting tired of what I'm doing. He says, I, I'd like to have a broader responsibility. Well, you know, that's, that's kind of important. And not a week passed when I was in Phil Haas's office, and Phil would frequently ask me about people because he knew I was personnel-oriented in psychology. psychology. He, he said he was on the General Motors Institute board. He said, we're looking for a new president of GMI. He said, got any ideas? And I said, yeah, I do. I said, why don't you think of Bill Cunningham? He said, oh, he'd never leave. Mechanical, would he? I said, you ought to ask him. Not a few weeks passed, he became president of GMI, and I think did a great job. Yeah. Now, this is what happens. The problem of communicating uh, with people uh, probably ought to be improved. Uh, one day, I was in President Hanson's office, and uh, I was very close to George Hawkins. And George and I were very close friends. He made Kachina dolls. I would provide him some of the walnut that went into them. We often talked about that. George had a real streak of art. He was tremendous, and I, I really enjoyed him. And he was in this uh, vice president provost job, and he said, I he says, I really want to retire. But he says, they keep piling stuff on me. And he says, I really want to retire. I was with Hanson, and Hanson says, you know, I kind of like a new provost. And I said, well, why don't you ask George to retire? Oh, he'd never retire. I said, why don't you ask him? I said, he wants to retire. And by golly, it wasn't long before we had a new provost and George was happily retired. See, these, this kind of communication doesn't take place. Yeah, Don't ask me why, Catherine. It's, it's interesting. Now, this is not a fault. This is human behavior. That's right. Uh, it's just the way it is. Uh, you sometimes don't know what those nearest and dearest really want. And uh, or take time to ask. I learned a lot. Yeah. Let's. Um, how about um, your favorite Purdue tradition? You have one of those, a favorite Purdue tradition. Comes to mind. Uh, or an outstanding event. I think you've highlighted quite a few. I think that's, that's cut well covered in that. So, and and uh, I'm gonna turn it back to you to make you've got some closing comments and things that you'd like to. Well, if, when I look back. What? I think that's probably the happiest event was when he got his kids. Oh, I don't know. You know, these things happen to you. The thing that pleased me about that was that this was faculty generated. Um, I was always very faculty oriented and 
when the new deans would come on, like Gentry, I'd say, Don, you've got to put a smile on your face and shake a faculty member's hand whenever you see one and ask them how they're doing and what they need. Um, you know, you don't need to get into details with faculty. You have to, you have to know what they're doing and thank them. Uh, thank them for all the contributions they're making. And uh, at no time should they call you their boss, because I said, you're working for them, not the vice versa. And I think the faculty kind of like me. I always taught, Catherine, throughout my deanship. Sometimes I taught six hours. Uh, at one, at one semester, you know, two, three hour courses, uh, which would be a half time by most faculty members' criteria. I would teach late in the day, or it's 7.30 in the morning. And I remember one semester when I taught 7.30 and then at late in the day I taught a 4.30 or something like that class. And son of a gun, first day of class, I was in, involved in a Somebody came in and we got in a committee meeting of some kind. I forgot all about this class. If you don't think that just killed me. It was over in Smith Hall. I think that was a Monday. On a Wednesday, the same thing happened. I got so tied up, I just completely forgot. Well, by Friday, I was going mad. I just can't miss the class again. Here were these kids, they came out to the class and would sit there. And I finally showed up on Friday and I, oh, this was the best class that I've ever taught in my life. I knew all those kids and, oh, we just had more fun and we learned more than any class that I've ever taught in my whole career. And here I missed two of their first meetings. And those kids were so, they were so, uh, appreciative, they were patient, the best group of kids I ever had. And I remember one uh, from Logansport. Uh, Donato. Yeah, Tony Donato. His folks ran the uh, foreign auto company over in, in uh, Logansport. And uh, Tony um, was a kid that was he was a wrestler in high school. He was kind of rough hewn. And he later met a girl here at Purdue, started to attend convos and hear violinists and orchestras and all, opened his whole world to him. And he became one of our real scholars. And he, by the way, one of the people that I had uh, uh, Kevin Ryan room with because he was so good in his studies. And, uh, but he was one of those students. But you know, you do crazy things. But I, I, I think maybe the most important thing was my relationship with faculty and students. Um, I didn't miss committee committee meetings at all. Uh, I, when I first came to Purdue, I was chairman or secretary of seventeen committees. And you know, uh, well, you become an expert in Robert's Rules of Order, and you be become expert at doing minutes. And I became an expert in both these areas. But these are things that, you know, when you retire, you say to yourself, I'll never attend another committee meeting. That's a thing of the past. And so, I think I've been pretty good at that, haven't I? You know, I don't go to too many committee meetings. But uh, in terms of retirement activity, I, uh, I still go to the uh, alumni meetings of our, North, our, our Southwestern Michigan group. And uh, one of the proud things there is I started uh, a scholarship program for them. They didn't have one. And now they're one of the biggest scholarship 
I think, uh, of any of the alums in the whole country. Uh, these alumni people, you know, it isn't enough to get together or go to an occasional game or a dinner or something like that. You've got to have a focus. And there isn't anything more important than scholarships for students. Absolutely the most important thing. Right. Even more critical today. Yeah. Right. And I think as I, that and libraries, I give money to libraries and scholarships. And that's pretty much it. Louise, uh, a few years ago, gave all of her books on the great sculptor Henry Moore. And we had, you know, piles of books on him because during my experience, I wanted a Henry Moore in front of our building. And so as a result, I became a friend of his before he died. And uh, he knew about our needs and what have but died before we could get that taken care of. But as a result, we met his niece who became a good friend. And Louise couldn't collect Henry Moore's, so she collected books on him. And she had hundreds of books on Henry Moore, and she gave them to the library at her undergraduate college. Nice. And uh, I th they really appreciate those. Because, you know, how many people specialize and could do this? Now, of course, I've got a problem. I don't, I haven't looked at your collection to find out how big your collection is in uh, Chinese ceramics. Is it big or not? Do you have uh, a I good collection? I don't have collection? a feel for it, I'm not sure. I'd like to know what it is, to know whether my collection, you know, would be appreciated. I've got things that are kind of rare and uh, uh, th these are areas that you wander into, and the problem, Catherine, is that it's finding people that you can talk to. You don't find anybody that knows anything about these areas. Uh, what I did was I joined the Oriental Ceramic Society of London, and I've been on two trips with them to China to visit ancient kiln sites. And uh, these are people that, you know, are really knowledge knowledgeable about ceramics. But in this country, you just don't find very many people. Mm -hmm. The uh, major collections in the country. We're going to tell her about David Moore. Yeah, th there was, there is one guy on campus. Do you know Dave Moore? Mm -hmm. He's a statistics professor. Okay. Uh, Dave and I used to run together over in the gym every day. One time I was in London. I was in the Victoria and Albert Museum and up on the back third floor is where they keep the Chinese collection of salting and some of the other great collectors. And uh, three rooms. Nobody's there. I mean, just you're all alone with the, the keeper. I looked down, way down here, and here's a guy with a beard coming toward me. I thought, he looks terribly familiar. And as he came toward me, who is it but David Moore? I said, Dave, I didn't know you were interested in Chinese ceramics. Oh, he said, I'm really interested in that. I said, why didn't you mention this as we were running around the gymnasium? He said, I didn't know you were interested. He says, are you familiar with the Percival David collection? I said, no. He says, that's the best collection in the whole West. Well, within hours, I was over at the Percival David collection. But he's the one that introduced me to this very great collection of Chinese ceramics that was part of the University of London and shortly to be part of the British Museum because they're moving from their location at the University of London into the British Museum where they're going to really display this. But it's a really great, great collection. It's the greatest collection outside the two palace museums, the one in Beijing and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's the one that introduced me to this. But mm -hmm. um, I do have an opportunity occasionally to talk to those people, but Catherine, I'm not traveling anymore. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, once you reach a certain age, you don't want to go through all this hassle at the airport, losing your luggage to check in your heels or your boot to see if you're a terrorist, you know. You Not get sick and tired of that. Yeah. I want to thank you very much, Dr. McNeely, for this. Well, and this also, has been a lot of fun. I you, also you, mentioned that sitting in and making some comments with his wife, Louise, who I thank you both. Well, you've, had, you've forced me to, to review a lot of things that, uh, you know, when you live this, you almost have a feeling you don't want to relive it. You know, it was enough to get through it without reliving it. But I like... I like going over all these faculty that I knew and thinking about my relationship with them. And, right. you know, the, these, these relationships were the most important. Right. And, of course, my greatest one was with Jack and Oliver. I, mm -hmm. yeah. I love those guys. Right. They were great. Thank well, you. This has been a pleasure, Kathleen. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>